Welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm Kathleen Walter. With us now from New York is Israel's Deputy Minister of Defense, Danny Danan. The Deputy Minister is a member of the Likud Party and a staunch supporter of Israeli nationalism. He is also the author of the book, The Will to Prevail. And Deputy Minister Danan, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Kathleen. It's my pleasure. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad says that a Russian contract to supply anti-aircraft missiles from Russia is being implemented and also that Syria has received a shipment of these weapons. Russia also confirms that it is indeed fulfilling an order for the long-range surface-to-air missiles to Syria. Does Israeli intelligence show that Syria has indeed received these weapons from Russia? And how would such a delivery change the balance of power in the region? We are following very carefully what's happening today in Syria, and we are disturbed seeing the pictures of the civil war in Syria. I do not understand why Russia or any other nation would like to supply more weapons to this state at this, at this stage. I think it is a pity, but we are following it very carefully, and uh, we are ready for every scenario. Israel's Defense Minister Moshe Yalan on Tuesday signaled that the Israeli minister, minister, military rather was prepared to strike at shipments of these advanced Russian weapons. Syria's Assad says he will strike back. Do you see Israel taking military action? We, we have no intention uh, to start uh, any conflict in the region. Uh, we will do whatever is necessary to protect Israel. And we mm. have uh, proven it in the past that uh, we have the capability to defend our people, to defend our nation. And if we will have to do it, we will do it. So if Israel were to take military action, would it do it alone? Or is the assistance or help of the U.S. needed? Uh, we, we have shown that in the last uh, 65 years, Israel was a very strong nation in the Middle East. I do not recall any American troops coming to support Israel. We do have the same values, the same principles, but we are strong enough to deal with our enemies. But we work together. Uh, it's not the same like the issue of Iran, where we do call the U.S. and the nation to take a different approach. And uh, Kathleen, we speak a lot about Syria nowadays, but we cannot ignore what's happening in Iran. Mm -hmm. And I have some questions for you on Iran in just a couple of moments. But are you concerned that this Syrian civil war could blow up into a full-scale regional war? Well, nobody actually knows what will uh, be the outcome in Syria. Who will take over? Uh, what will be the, the end of the Assad regime? So we are following it very carefully. And yes, we see that the conflict in Syria is moving into Lebanon today. And who knows, it can go to other directions as well. That's why all the nations in the area, not only Israel, also Jordan, Turkey, all those nations are following very carefully the situation today in Syria. The White House hasn't ruled out plans for a no-fly zone in Syria. What is your assessment of the Obama administration's response to Syria? Well, I, I will not give uh, any points to the Obama administration regarding uh, Syria. I can tell you about the Israeli approach. We do not interfere in the civil war. We look at the pictures. We do not like to see those pictures, but we have no stand. We do not support any side. But what we hear from Syria is that each side is blaming the other side for working with Israel. So I can tell you very directly, we are not supporting and we are not working with any sides with the people who fight today in Syria. Would a no-fly zone work in Syria? And is a full-scale military intervention needed in Syria to topple the Assad regime, as some say? I think it is a very hard question to answer, but uh, the people in the U.S. and Europe should ask themselves until when they want to wait, which picture they want to see, until they will say that is enough, we cannot wait anymore. The number of casualties in Syria, unfortunately, it is amazing. More than 80,000 people died during this civil war. So the question is until when the Western societies will wait and do something regarding Syria. Mm -hmm. We know that the Assad regime is receiving help and assistance from Iran, whose nuclear program continues running apace. Israel's former military intelligence head, Major General Amos Yadlin, said this week that over the summer, Iran will reach one to two months before the final decision on a bomb. Can you confirm that to be the case? I can say it very clearly that Iran uh, is the core of evil in the region. You look what's happening today in the Middle East, and you see the hands of Iran all over with Hezbollah in Lebanon, with the people who are fighting today in Syria, with the people who are fighting today in the Sinai Peninsula. So we know that uh, Iran is sponsoring the, the paying, the sending uh, materials, weapons to those people in the region. And we are worried about that. And I think somebody will have to take action regarding Iran. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Israel you... cannot allow Iran to become nuclear. And uh, as you mentioned, it's only a matter of time. You can argue whether it's six months or 12 months, but we are getting closer to the point where somebody will have to do something. Mm -hmm. So has Iran already passed Israel's red line? And if so, will Israel strike? I, I think that if we, when we get to the point of red line, we will have to do whatever necessary to protect our people. Mm -hmm. History has taught us, Katrina, that we cannot ignore a leader who is full of hatred and is threatening to annihilate all the Jewish people. We cannot just sit idly by and say, let's weigh if he's serious or not. That is why when we hear the voices coming from Iran, we cannot ignore them. If the point will come and we'll see that the US, Europe, and all the other nations are ignoring Iran, Israel has the capability to, to protect itself. Mm -hmm. So what is Israel's red line? The, I will not go into specifics here, but basically when the Iranian will have the capability of using the nuclear technology for military usage, that is the point where we cannot allow it. Prime Minister Netanyahu has asked the U.S. for a meeting with Egyptian leaders. Hamas has asked Egypt to reevaluate the Camp David Accords with the ascension of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Do you see Egypt pulling out of the Accords? I don't see it happening today, but we see what's happening today in Egypt, and we are very worried about what's happening today in the Sinai Peninsula. We, we see the presence of Iranian technology, Iranian weapons, and we do want to see more presence of the Egyptian military. By the way, we approved the Egyptian to put more army forces within the Sinai Peninsula, even when it was against the agreement we signed with the Egyptian. But we do want to see them more active and in charge in what's happening today in Sinai. Is there a rise of radical jihadist forces now surrounding Israel and threatening its very existence? I think the rise of radical jihad is a threat not only to Israel. Yes, we are on the front line. But look what's happening today in Sweden, in the UK, in France, in Boston, here in the US. So we have to realize that there are some forces among radical Muslims who are eager to fight against us, the Saturday people, the Jews, but also against the Christians, and we have to fight them back. If we will ignore them, they will attack Israel first, but eventually they will attack the U.S. also. Do you think that the West failed to anticipate the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in the wake of the Arab Spring? I think we, we, we saw it, we understood it. I actually, in my book, Israel, the will to prevail, I say we should not use the term Arab Spring. Because spring, you think about something which is beautiful. And I think we should call it the Arab winter. It mm -hmm. is not a spring. And we are worried about it because we see the presence of the radical forces all over taking action. And we cannot ignore them. If you ignore them, they will become stronger. Turning to the war on terror, in a recent counterterrorism speech, President Obama said, quote, we must define our effort not as a boundless global war on terror, but rather as a series of persistent targeted efforts to dismantle specific networks of violent extremists that threaten America. Do you share the president's view of the war on terror? My point is very clear. It is a war. You see the forces of the radical jihad, the radical Muslim, and you can tie the dots. You can see the connection between them. They come from the same ideology. They mm -hmm. use the same techniques, the same hatred. And that's why it is not about land dispute in Israel. It is not about a culture dispute today in Sweden or France. It's about fight of radical forces, and we have to stand and fight it. It is not something that happened randomly. It's something that happened because there is an ideology behind it. Secretary of State John Kerry is working to launch a new Israel-Palestinian peace initiative. How firmly does the Israeli government still believe in a two-state solution? My position is very clear. I'm against a two-state solution because I see what happened today in the Gaza Strip. When we pulled out of Gaza eight years ago, Hamas stepped in and today it became a terror entity. I do not want to see another terror entity in Judea and Samaria or in a new Palestinian state. I think today we understand in Israel that there is no viable partner. With all due respect to all the great leaders who want to promote peace in the Middle East, you need a partner to promote peace. I do not see a real partner among the Palestinians. Prime Minister Netanyahu said it very clearly. We are willing to negotiate. You are welcome to come and speak with us, but nobody came so far. How would you describe the U.S. relationship right now with Israel? And has President Obama been a good ally to Israel? That is the main topic of my book, uh, 
about the relationship between Israel and the U.S., and I think we can see a change. We saw President Obama at the beginning of his first term taking a side with the Palestinians with his Cairo speech, where he spoke about going back to the 1967 lines, and we seeing a shift today toward more uh, a mediator approach, and uh, we have to wait and see what will be the outcome. But even if the U.S. will be balanced and will be in the middle, you still need a partner, which I do not see among the Palestinians today. Mm -hmm. Last question for you. Many Americans don't have a feel for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Can you give us a sense of what you believe he's doing right and maybe wrong in governing Israel? First of all, I can tell you uh, from a personal experience working with the Prime Minister, I think it is the hardest position in the world to be the Prime Minister of Israel. We have a great nation, a great country, but the region that we live in is very, very dynamic. Uh, so I think it is a very demanding position and uh, he's doing the best to protect Israel. We invest a lot of time on security issues uh, and unfortunately also a lot of money on this issue. But I think Prime Minister Netanyahu got the support from the Israeli people and that's what counts. We need to do what is good for Israel and not to try to satisfy anybody else, including people in Washington or in Europe. All right. Israeli Deputy Minister of Defense Danny Danan, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV.